Chosen. What's your chosen? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Every time I went to order something, it was like for the kids' stocking, socks, or they were always out. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, so like, although CBD also has them now. So. Well, good morning. Well, good morning and uh, welcome back to us, our study on Joshua. Um, Joy was handing out the colored map again. That was very nice. We can reference that. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the people that gather in your house. We thank you for a house that we can gather in, or God, that we can call our church family. Bless the time we spent together this morning as we study your word and, and, and look for revelations from your Holy Spirit. Lord, we bring our petitions to you because we know that you listen and, and, and you hear. Um, we pray first for, for Monica, uh, Diane's dear friend, who uh, another mass has been found in, and um, she is being taken to the hospital and perhaps in need of surgery. We, uh, we pray for um, just a strengthening in marriage um, for those struggling, um, those um, particularly, particularly young who are in marriage and, 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 and need guidance, we just pray, Lord God, that your spirit be with them. We pray for the family of Beth Sylvester, who, who passed away yesterday. Um, we pray for their family, that uh, for her family, that they be encouraged and strong, that um, she now has, has received the full promise of resurrection with Christ. We pray for our pastor who underwent surgery yesterday for his hip replacement and um, by all indications uh, was a very successful operation. And um, we just pray that the Lord that he um, slows down enough to let the healing catch up. Um, be with him and strengthen him. Bless this time we spend together today in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, all right. 
so we've got um, Joshua 21 or 22, which is an incredible read. Um, you know, oftentimes where people say, well, it's not much more force in, in, in day-to-day life in, in, uh, in the Old Testament. It's just a book of history. Well, this chapter has, is just ripe with stuff that we can take away on how to apply to our life today. So we're going to, um, um, we have lots of readings, and um, we'll get started with, um, well, let's hand them up. Carlene, uh, Numbers 32, and uh, Mark, Mark uh, Psalm 89, 34, Diane, Psalm 37, 30, Mike 15, 1, Leslie, oh, I missed that. I missed you. Yes. How could I do that? I don't know. Oh, give back the tomato. <laughs> wow. Excuse me. I was looking down my paper. Didn't look up. Um, okay, Marilyn, take what I said to uh, Diane. Yes. Thirty-seven, thirty. Diane, Proverbs fifteen, one. Mike, Proverbs twelve, eighteen. Leslie, twenty-five, eleven. Joy. Matthew 12, 37. All right, Carlina's back. And uh, Marge, uh, Psalm 141.3. Marilyn, Romans 12, 18. And um, that's all the readings assigned. And let's just... Um, Jump right in. First off, we'll, we'll think about the map because they, right away they start talking about uh, dividing things up um, in this. And um, um, this little map that's in color is really, really gives a good indication of the three tribes, two and a half tribes that's, that went back to the west um, side of the Jordan River, the Manasseh, the Gad, and Reuben. Nothing to do with the same one. And um, so Israel today is east of the river. Or, well, west of the river. Um, so when they do that chant, you know, from, from the river to the sea, um, which, well, anyway, uh, that's, an area, that's the area that we're referencing there, and that's where Israel is today. Um, on the west bank, towards the great sea. So that's the two and a half tribes we're talking about. Two and a half because you can see Manasseh uh, stays, half the tribe stays on the west side of the, the Jordan. So that's the two and a half. So as we go through that, that just sort of gives you a reference for how we uh, how we start that. And Joy, you're going to start reading, uh, if you would please, on verse 1 of chapter 22. Joshua summoned the Reubenites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, and told them, You have done everything Moses, the Lord's servant, commanded you, and have obeyed me in everything I commanded you. You have not deserted your brothers even once in this whole time, but have carried out the requirements of your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brethren, as he promised them. Therefore, turn and go to your home in the land where your possession lies, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. Take good care to observe the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cleave to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their homes. Now to the, one, to the one half of the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given possession in Bashan, but to the other half, Joshua had given possession beside their brothers in the land west of the Jordan. And when the, Joshua sent them into their homes and blessed them, and when Joshua sent them away to their homes and blessed them, he said to them, go back to your tents with much wealth and very much livestock, with silver, gold, bronze, and iron, and with much clothing. Divide the spoils among your enemies with your brothers. 
So the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh return home, parting from the people of Israel at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go to the land of Gilead, Gilead their own land of which they had possessed by themselves by the command of the Lord through Moses. And when they came to the region of the Jordan, which is in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an altar there by the Jordan, a great, impressive altar. Now the children of Israel heard someone say, Behold the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh, have built an altar on the frontier of the land of Canaan, in the region of the Jordan, on the children of Israel's side. And when the children of Israel heard it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered together at Shiloh to go to war against them. Then the children of Israel said, Phineas, the son of Elbeah, the priest, to the children of Reuben, to the children of Gad, and to half the tribe of Manasseh into the land of Gilead. And with him ten rulers, one ruler each from the chief house of every tribe of Israel, and each one was the head of the house of his father among the divisions of Israel. Then they came to the children of Reuben, to the children of Gad, and to half the tribe of Manasseh, to the land of Gilead, and they spoke with them, saying, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, What treachery is this that you have committed against the God of Israel, to turn away this day from following the Lord, in that you have built yourselves an altar, so that you might rebel this day against the Lord? Was not the sin of Peor enough for us? Up to this very day, we have not cleansed ourselves from that sin even though a plague fell on the community of the Lord. And are you now turning away from the Lord? If you rebel against the Lord today, tomorrow he will be angry with the whole community of Israel. If the land you possess is defiled, come over to the Lord's land, where the Lord's tabernacle stands, and share the land with us. But do not rebel against the Lord or against us by building an altar for yourselves other than the altar of the Lord our God. Did not Achan, the son of Zechariah, break faith to the matter of the devoted things, and wrath fell upon all the co congregations of Israel, and he did not perish alone for his iniquity. Then the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half-tribe of the Menachem, Menasee, said in answer to the head of the families of Israel, The mighty one God, the Lord, the mighty one God, the Lord. He knows and lets Israel itself know if it was a rebellion or in breach of faith against the Lord. Do not spare us today. For building an altar to turn away from following the Lord, or if we did so to offer burnt offerings, to bring offering peace, offering on it, may the Lord himself take vengeance. No, but we did it from fear that in time to come your children might say to our children, what have you to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you, you people of Reuben and people of Gad. You have no portion in the Lord, so your children might take our children, make our children cease to worship the Lord. Therefore we said, let us now build an altar, not for burnt offering, or, nor for sacrifice, but to be a witness between us and you, and between our generations after us, that we do perform the service of the Lord in his presence with our burnt offerings, and sacrifices and peace offerings, so that your children will not say to our children in time to come, you have no portion of the Lord. Therefore said we that it shall be when they should so say to us or to our generations in time to come that we may say again, Behold, the pattern of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, not for burnt offerings nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between us and you. God forbid that we should rebel against the Lord 
and turn this day from following the Lord to build an altar for burnt offerings, for meat offerings, for sacrifices, besides the altar of the Lord our God that is before this tabernacle. Joy, you want to pick back up? Okay. When Phineas the priest and the community leaders, the heads of Israel's clan, who were with him, heard that the descendants of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh had to say, they were pleased. Phineas, son of Eleazar the priest, said to the descendants of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, Today we know that the Lord is among us, because you have not committed this treachery against him. As a result, you have delivered the Israelites from the Lord's power. Then Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest and the chiefs, returned from the Reubenites and the Gadites in the land of Gilead to the land of Canaan, to the people of Israel, and brought back word to them. And the report pleased the people of Israel, and the people of Israel blessed God and spoke no more of making war against them to destroy the land where the Reubenites and the Gadites were settled. The Reubenites and the Gadites called the altar witness, for, said they, it is a witness between us that the Lord is God. Anybody want to try and take a shot at summarizing what just went on? <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so the land was portioned out to all the clans. Yeah. And they were able to rest from their warfare and go home and, and build their lives. And the people on the east side, or the west side, pardon me. Yeah. 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 Um, when they crossed over to go to their homes, they built an altar near the river. And Joshua thought it was to, you know, pray to other gods. Yeah. But then once he confronted them, they explained to him that it was simply um, an image to put there so that on the other side of the river, they would know that they still had a, a portion with the Lord's blessings and so forth. Okay, that's good. Yeah, apparently you couldn't worship in any area but the one spot that yes. was ordained to start with. So. Which strikes us as odd because we have all have our own <laughs> spots. <laughs> yeah. So I read this, and, and I guess I spent a lot of my lifetime uh, in conflict resolution. Um, <laughs> you know, as a, as a manager of large groups of people, um, misunderstandings happen, and you. See, you spend an inordinate amount of time uh, dealing with just misunderstandings and, and uh, people jumping to conclusions and just, it, it's, um, most of the time it's, it's kind of, <laughs> you sit back and you listen to it and you wonder, how did we get to this point uh, when we started way over here? How did that, like, what was the progression? And I think this chapter is just, resplendent with, with uh, um, an example of, of how we get ourselves into deep messes all the time. Um, I was, one, one of the strangest ones I had, I was managing a lot of, uh, a large business down in Mexico, and we were supplying sister plants, so same company. Uh, we were the internal supplier to and uh, of course, Mexico and the United States have one immediate big difference, language. And um, um, there was a catastrophe that happened, you know, a mistake happened, um, and um, the American plant found out that the, you know, the, the Mexican plant phoned and said, you know, well, uh, this happened yesterday afternoon. And, and uh, so then the Americans got really mad. Well, why didn't you tell us yesterday? No, why did why did why did we come in this morning to this great surprise? And uh, they're going like, and so the, the debate and questions went back and forth. And the anger was rising on both sides, and it dawned on me that it was a matter of just time. Mexicans talk about like when we when we Americans talk about time, we're talking this afternoon. 
you know, three o'clock yesterday afternoon in Mexico, it's still afternoon at six o'clock. It isn't until the sun goes down that the, the moon comes out that they start talking about a difference in time. Well, they did, they found out about it, and with time change, after everybody in Ohio went home. And, you know, it was, so it was really just a matter of everybody jumping to the conclusions that somebody did something intentionally to take me off, mm -hmm. you know, or to hide something from them. Um, and that, that turned out to be probably the thing I spent the last eight years of my career in Jack's Patrol spending all my time on was just people jumping to the wrong conclusions. And, and that's what I get out of chapter 22. So you begin the chapter with, um, um, with a couple of questions, but we're going to do the reference readings first, just the first two. So, Carlene, if you would read numbers 32, and no, who did I start with? Yeah, you were right. Yeah, yeah okay. I got it. And then you two, I didn't sign in your readings too because you were late for class. Um, <laughs> 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 and then who did I assign Psalm 39? You? Okay, Mark, good. Okay. So let's read those two, please. If a man vows a vow to the Lord and swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. All right. Mark. Psalm 89, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Yeah. All right. So the whole thing is as I'm keeping your word, right? Yeah. Um, um, so we, we see we all know the value of that. You know where you can where your word was was binding. You know um, yeah. the whole thing about shaking right hand, you know, shaking hands. It's like a, like a contract. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, we, our reputation is the most valuable thing we have, and all of that good stuff. And it should have an effect. It should have, it should have, um, it should bring to mind the commandment about putting the best spin on things. You know, not always thinking the worst of your, of your, of your peers or whoever you're with. So, in the first couple of questions, in what, in what way, had the two and a half tribes kept the commandment of the Lord. And we see that in the beginning of the reading. Uh, so how did they do that? They kept God's commands and Moses' commands and Joshua's commands. Okay, what commands were those? Well, everything leading up to this point. In <laughs> yeah, so um, other thoughts? Yeah, to expand on what she said, you know, it was that or you can have this land over here, but you still need to help everybody else conquer and get their land over there yeah. before you go back home and settle down. Yeah. And they did that. They, you know, so the, the two and a half tribes faithfully fulfilled their commitment. If you remember way back when, they had uh, um, the two and a half tribes said, hey, this is really good pasture land over here. We want to be farmers. You know, that's really, what, that's, that's our interest. So why don't you, we'll just take this land and settle here with our family. And the other tribe said, not a problem, except <laughs> you're not going to sit on your laurels over there while we're doing all the fighting over here. So you're going to bring your team with you. And um, when it's all done and we've conquered all the land that the Lord has promised, then you can go back. So they did that. They they, they left their, their <clears throat> livestock and, and families behind, and they went and joined the joined the armies of the other tribes and secured victory. Pretty noble, right? We can yes, all agree. Good. good guys, right? They 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 made a commitment. They lived with their commitment. Um, there there was no questioning about it. In fact, if you notice, they didn't even say, "Okay, we're done now." <laughs> no, they said. They, they waited. They waited until um, um, you have, when, when, uh, at the time Joshua summoned them. Said, okay, you guys have done a really good job. Wow, pretty cool. You, 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 you know, we, we all agreed to this. You got the other land. We all agreed that you'd come and fight, put your life on the line for us. Really good guys, right? So we release you. You can go back. 
So to me, they've, they've established a reputation of being credible guys, you know? So they, um, um, you know, we, we, we see later in scripture where it talks about, you know, who would put their life on the line for a friend, you know? But here, they proved that they and, would. and these guys did. They really did that. They put their life on the line uh, to go fight for, you know, sort of land that wasn't going to be theirs. They were going back across the river. So I think uh, if I was going to buy a used car from them, I'd feel okay. You know, that's, so, so you got that. So then on good communications, um, Maryland, not that I want to forget your name yet, dear. here. Uh, you're going to start reading 3730. Right. All right. Okay. And then we'll go around and read um, until, uh, well, we'll read all, all of the, the okay. assigned readings. Psalm 3730. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom, and his tongue talks of justice. Okay, Proverbs 15.1. A soft answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs twelve eighteen. There is one, who, there is one whose rash words are like a sword thrust, but the talk of the wise brings healing. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Continue to keep God's commandments. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Of course, he brings in the law, which gets back to that altar business. <laughs> he reminded them to put the Lord first. Um, I've commanded you, you have not forsaken your brothers, but you have been careful to keep the charge of the Lord. And now the Lord your God has given rust to your brothers as he promised them. Therefore, turn away from your tents. Um, verse 5, only be careful to observe the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cling to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their tents. So the reminder was that, um, you know, to continue doing the right things, um, honoring God, um, reminder that they're still co covered under, under both the covenant and the commands, um, and, and, the, and the commandments of God, that as, as they depart, they're still, um, you know, they're, they're still expected to be good Jews. Um, 
keep working against backsliding also. Yeah. So he's, you know, in this, he's, he's really noted their high character um, and, and the fact that they have been so faithful. And then, so, that, you know, pretty good statement. And then he's encouraging them to continue in that. Be careful to observe the commandments of the law which Moses, the servant, has given. One of the recurring, or let's see, the, the um, um, so where did they get all the stuff in verse 8 that they could take back with them? From the people they conquered. Right. So, um, divide it up among them. Yeah. Remember the first conquering, they were told not to not to touch it, but then uh, they were allowed with the, with the, as they continued the conquest, to take the spoils of war and to lay claim to them. So they took the spoils of war, equally divided up amongst them all, you know, the, the whole tall tribes, um, and um, they were to return with that. Um, One of the recurring lessons we've learned in Joshua is that one victory doesn't guarantee another. Often the Israelites obeyed God and really did and, and did really well, only to become careless and rely on their own wisdom and fail the next time. I think I don't know about you, but I got lots of examples of that um, in my life, and I think that's typical. Um, is um, um, you know we think we've we've gotten you know all the things that worked out really well. Um, so I must be doing really good, you know, that's, that's where I go with that. Um, instead of looking at, you know, the blessings that I've been given and to continue in the way. Um, so I usually decide that I'm a pretty good dude and, you know, I'm getting what I deserve. Um, so just because there's victories in some areas doesn't mean there's going to be victories at all. But these guys, they had done what they were told to do. And, um, and and they've they've been successful. Um, they, they've uh, they've amassed quite a bit of spoils from the war, um, and they're taking it all back with them. So part of that I see when I when I think about this from a conflict resolution point of view is that um, um, there wasn't really any animosity amongst the guys. You know, they the the, the tribes that were going to stay on the west bank. Um, were okay with sharing with the tribes that were going to go to the other side. So they viewed them as equals and trustworthy. And I think that's, that's what I picked up from that, is that, you know, you got 12, 12 teams all pulled together, and they got, they got the mountain of woods there, and they divided it all up equally. So there was a sense of brotherhood about it, was what I picked up from it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering. Um, we know that the people who were going to stay on the west side, their families stayed there while yeah. they went to fight. What about all the other guys? Did their families go with them yes. as they were fighting? Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty typical. The the armies would go out ahead and bring the family behind. Um, I, I'm not good at, at remembering names, but there's a story of of the two brothers who got into the big fight, and he was coming back, yeah. and. Um, Esau, the, the one that he had conned out of his birthright, um, they talked about you know sending the family first, you know, which was reverse of what you normally would do. So um, the uh, um, but the family would come behind, and then I guess if they lost, they could like, pull back, yeah. yeah, run home to mom. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Um, so they, they've got all their spoils, they've, uh, they've divided everything up. Um, then on their way back, they did what? Built an altar. They built an altar. And um, now, what do you make of this, like at this point in time, in the, in the narrative that we're talking about? They stopped and they built an altar. And this altar becomes sort of the, 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 the pinnacle of the 
the issues that they're going to have, the big strife they're going to go through. Um, it's kind of hard to understand because everywhere that they went, they pretty much set up the altar. But then because of the laws in Deuteronomy where they're not supposed to have more than that central sanctuary, mm -hmm. it kind of, it's something like I said, it's hard for us to understand because we all yes. go off and, okay. and worship somewhere. And that, that would be my first take that, you know, yeah. Apparently it wasn't to worship, yeah. but it was, or yeah. to offer sacrifice. So, so the first assumption is, is that they're stopping to build an altar that they're going to worship at before they cross over the river. Marilyn, or Carly. Couldn't it be, too, to make an example of the new altar oh. so that people would know that they are not to do sacrifices and all the other stuff because oh. they're, they're told not to, just to worship? Yeah. Pat. Um, could it be also that they were doing something for their children, yeah. so their children wouldn't backslide? Yeah, 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 and that's and that's what they that end up being the reason. So if I'm sitting here with the with the, um, the on the on the West Bank, and I get word that this group over there that has just stopped and built an altar. I have. I have go ahead, Pat. It, no, I was going to say it reminds me of when the people were marching. The 40 years that they were walking, 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 yeah. that new crop of children had to be circumcised. Yeah. Had to be, because they had to know, if they weren't yeah. prepared for the promised land. Kind of reminds me of yeah. how we have to pass on what we know to the next generation. Yeah. So um, let's, let's try to put ourselves in, in, in the, uh, on the West Bank. We're, um, we're, we're with the, the 10 tribes over here, or the nine and a half tribes, whatever it is. And uh, we're, we're all sitting around talking about, the guys are gone now, you know, let's, let's, let's get ourselves. And, and, and the runner comes in with the news, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The guys who just left town are building an altar um, over, over by the river before they cross over to their homeland. How does it start? Well, how does the conversation start? We're all sitting around the fire, what happens? They jump to the conclusion. Huh? They jump to the conclusion. Okay, they jump to the conclusion. That they're going to worship on that altar. Oh, uh, the altar's for worship. Yeah. So, um, and, and, and what happens then? So, so you got, I don't know, around your dining room table, and somebody comes in with news about uh, the sister in law or something. Uh, you know, how does it transpire? How do we get from. You know, this is the news to, this is the worst situation ever. How do we get there? Doubt. Doubt. Mistrust. So, mistrust. Mistrust. Suspicion. Mm -hmm. um, and if you got a group together, it gets worse. Yeah. Oh man, it gets worse. You know? People always think the worst before the best. And. And one person throws in a negative comment, and uh, that gets somebody over here riled up a little bit. And, uh, and then pretty soon, oh my gosh. Yeah. A molehill becomes a mountain. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's why there's a scripture, get an understanding. Yeah. The scripture that speaks that we need to get an understanding. Yeah. So from a conflict resolution point of view, um, how could have this been avoided? First, by the group that was leaving. What could they have done? Talked about it ahead of time. Communications. You know, yeah. hey, on the way out, we're going to put up this monument, this altar, this stone Ebenezer that uh, says this. So. And for the guys that are left behind who are sitting around the fire and uh, contemplating these evil guys that just left town, what could they have done? Thought about what they just been through, how much they were at their back. Yeah. So, you know, instead of jumping to the worst conclusion, the commandment and, and in Luther's explanation of the commandment of a small catechism is what? But the, the best, best construction. construction. <laughs> yeah. All of this could have been avoided 
if they just said, you know, they're pretty good guys. I can't believe they would do something that they knew would put us all in jail. Just hard to believe. Let's go ask them. So, um, well, and boy, would that ever solve a lot of problems. Um, so we know how the rest of Israel reacted. Um, then they were justified in being concerned about the altar. They've got a history of where um, they, they, they altered her built where they weren't supposed to be, and um, um, it had it had negative effect on on the um, on the nation itself. So, so there's some some legitimacy for you know. So you can't blame the guys. You know, at the same time, you got you know put yourself in their shoes with the history that they've got. You go, okay, you know, I can see why they're a little panicked. Um, Although usually they were living in somebody else's land, yeah. but this time it wiped out yeah. <laughs> all yeah. those people. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just had this. But nowhere does it say that Joshua was part of this group that went, what, went after him. Um, I didn't realize that until just now. Um, so, after Joshua has made this proclamation of what good guys they are, I guess he, it doesn't look like he was part of this, I don't know. Um, so, Let's, uh, let's continue with the questions. Um, so one application we can pull out of this is we're ever in a position of leadership, and we are all in a position of leadership. Every one of us. We either have children, grandchildren, we have, you know, in some situation, we are all looked upon as being the authority for a certain situation. I had a manager work for me. I oh, he drove me nuts. I said to him, um, we were trying to do some leadership training, and he looked at me. This is a guy I'm paying seventy thousand dollars here. This is thirty years ago, and and he said to me, I don't want to be a leader. I want to be a manager. <laughs> well, isn't a manager a leader? Well, that's what I sort of thought. So, um, he says, I don't want to be a leader. I got no interest in being a leader. I said, you got any kids? And he said, yeah, three. And I said, who leads them? If not you, who? You know? Mm. We are leaders. That's, that's why I really like the way Luther talks about vocation. It isn't what, just what we do for a living. It's what we do for life. You know, in, in all of the things that we do, it's a vocation. God has placed us in a position to do something. Not to just collect a paycheck. Not just to you know, gain the benefits or, or, or not just to be the boss. He's, he, we're in a position, the vocation he's placed us, to, to live out the gospel. And um, so I, I really appreciate Luther's words on vocation. And I think this is an example of it. If we're, if we're in a position um, where we're, you know, have to make decisions, we may have to judge between different parties. Parents judge between children, teachers judge between students, I hate the word bosses, uh, judge between employees. We should be just and fair and not favor one party over another. Um, and this is what, this, the thought struck me about Joshua. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to, I wish I'd have caught this yesterday when I could have read it for or, or on, on Friday. That Joshua was a part of this, so as the leader, he may have been wise enough to say, guys, let's just tone it down, you know, um, let's just, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt, let's go ask what's going on. Um, instead, they took like a war party, you know, all these guys, I can imagine they're all sitting around thinking, all right, we built this thing as a witness, a witness to our children, you know, so that they don't forget where we come from and what we've been through. 
This is the testimony of who we are and how God has delivered us and treated us. And they're all sitting around going, you know, this is pretty good. And then, you know, like a war party shows up behind them going, what are you guys doing? You know, wow. Talk about an opportunity for anger and for violence, um, for misunderstanding. All right. Um, we should be careful not to presume to know the facts, which we don't. And we learn that through the presumption comes nothing but strife. Um, and what's really going on here is they're judging motive. You know, um, the majority of the tribe made a, made a judgment about the motive of the Western tribes. They were not given the benefit of the doubt, neither did they delay judgment until finding out more information. They just jumped to conclusions. Um, even after they've had this wonderful opportunity as, as a combined army, you know, um, to all the victories. Um, so, um, we must be careful not to judge others. We can think of ways in which believers judge others' motivations. Um, there's, um, you know, we, I'm sure we can all think of opportunities we've had where we maybe have thought the worst of somebody when it turned out to be exactly the opposite. Um, whenever we claim to know the why of what other people do, we have to be careful. We don't falsely judge their motives. Since we can't see people's hearts, it's better to leave the motivations between them and God. Now, having said that, there's, um, there is a time and a place you know, where if there is a discussion or a disagreement, or somebody sees somebody doing something, or or somebody saying something, to open and engage in communications, not to run and hide from them, not to go tattle, but to deal with an issue openly and honestly. And um, we're given that guidance by taking, you know, go and talk to your brother. And if uh, your brother ain't listening, you know, get the elders and come back, you know. Um, don't take a posse like these guys did, you know? <laughs> you know? Think you're gonna show up. You're, even, even in doing it with numbers like that, it's, it's an act of intimidation. I mean, that's really what it is. Um, so we're, we're given some guidance on how to resolve conflict. There's a conflict on the internet right now which, which is really fascinating to watch. Really fascinating to watch. And it's in the church, if you would call it that, was, um, I think the gentleman's name, Mark Driscoll. Okay, um, so right now there's a move in the, in the, in the particularly in the evangelical churches, uh, for masculine Christianity. Trying to put, you know, um, stop this feminization of, of the role of father and, and, and manhood and all this stuff. And so there's this move to, uh, and I'm not talking about the benefits or the, the, the problems with any of that. It, you can debate that all you want. Um, but they're having these large national conferences where they're bringing in thousands of men into these, um, these conferences. And um, you know, on the, on, the, on the backdrop and the screens behind the, the speakers, they got motorcycles, they got weightlifting, you know, like all that manly stuff, you know. Um, so they opened this one. Um, it's even hard to do that. Like, you know, you scratch your head how they with a male stripper. Oh, <laughs> that's supposed to be manly. I don't. I I I, 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 I don't know how that works. I don't think so. Really, uh, the, the, so. <laughs> but when you ain't got the gospel and the law, I guess you you got to be creative. And uh, so they they opened with a male stripper, and um, uh, I think it was Mark Driscoll come out on stage the next day. Um, having talked to the guy in charge, um, and he came out and he was he, and he publicly called that out as a sin. God love him. I, um, know, I missed. I, I don't know. Is this the the evangelical evangelical church that brought out the stripper? Yes. Okay. That, that doesn't I, make sense. Right. <laughs> um, okay. I you got my vote, um, but at the same time, <laughs> at the same time, I don't. I don't you know. I, I'm not standing in judgment, but 
It's, it's the, just to look at the, 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 the way that the conflict uh, happened in this group. So Mark apparently had talked to the guy in charge, um, but hadn't said much about the issue. And then the, he came out on the stage and without naming any names, he condemned that. Um, that um, he called it the spirit of Jezebel. And he condemned that as contrary to the teaching of scripture and all the rest of it. So um, then the guy in charge came out and threw him off the stage. Okay, so those are probably really good ways to demonstrate that's not how to resolve How not conflict. to do something. Okay. <laughs> now, none of us are going to sit here. I just I can't imagine anybody going to sit here and talk about the idea that the male stripper was a good idea. <laughs> I, I have trouble putting the best spin on that, but um, but the way they tried to resolve it was a problem. Yes, ma'am. Who was the audience? Uh, Two thousand men who <laughs> okay. were there to become. That's what I thought. Max. Well, I'm, <laughs> Max okay, Max. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I, they would have been better off with a biker. The, the, <laughs> truthfully, I think you're always better off with a biker. Yeah, so I'm not sure what was going on there. But, but really, you know, but you can see. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's wild. Um, the stuff in the church goes on all the time. The church is not perfect. No. Uh, and, uh, that's, uh, that's, so, uh, that's so obvious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why. Yeah. But that's beautiful people. Yeah. But, but, I, but I want you to see. Yeah, this is a pastor. Was this, is this person that brought this male stripper out a pastor? Yeah, yeah, they were all pastors. Oh, they were all. Oh. Yeah, except the stripper. I don't think he was ordained. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's not a man of God conference that we support. <laughs> I have no idea where they got him from. I don't even know where to look for them. So anyway, <laughs> but it is crazy. But it, um, it it shows like the types of conflicts that can happen, and and the, and the difficulty in trying to resolve. The, so they threw the good guy off the stage. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now the question is, could he have? Could he or should he have? Um, just spoke to the executive in charge and and talked about it there, or did he do the or or did he do the right thing? Well, maybe he wanted all those men there to know that this is not a good example. Publicly calling and, out public and sin. And he wasn't sure if he just went to the one person, if that one person would have come back to say, "We, may, I made a mistake yeah. by presenting things this way." Yeah. He may not have done that. Yeah. So. Um, on both, uh, like in all of this mix-up, what, what I would say is both these guys have, have strong reputations inside the evangelical circles. Um, it seems like they, they, there would have been other ways to resolve this conflict um, besides the fact that whoever hired the guy is a lunatic. You might but, have um, had a nice father come to the podium. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably. How did the audience react? They were in support of Driscoll. They like this. Drink. Yeah. The trouble is, is that, and, and, and this this is a, a really good example of you know taking an issue and, and looking at it different levels, okay, and peeling yeah. it back a little bit. One of the problems is none of the men who sat in that congregation or that group, that conference center, while the stripper was going on, got up and left. They should have. It was actually a sword swallower. <laughs> the sword swallower. I don't want to get into that. Okay. I don't want to get into that. Part. Who just had, took had, his shirt off? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't quite. The stripper had a pole and a sword. And, uh, you know, I don't want to get into all of it. Oh, However, yeah. today, to, to just you know, so we, we talk about how to resolve conflict. Today is April the fifteenth. Uh, no, no, um, that was yesterday. Oh, okay, well, yesterday then we had um, uh, the anniversary of an event within the LCMS that um, I'm like I like the LCMS history so. This is the anniversary of an event where the people who came over from Germany in 1840s, um, the guy who brought them over, uh, Stefan, um, went off the rails and um, did some things he shouldn't have done. He didn't hire a male stripper, but he, he, 
he did some things he shouldn't have done, and they sent him on the other side of the river. <laughs> and then they had to figure out, what do we do with the church? And it really is cornerstone to the founding of the LCMS. But it all came about through conflict. And the way they resolved that conflict was they had a debate. CFW Walther and this other gentleman um, had a debate. And out of the debate, they came up with the core things about a church that are important. Is the other gentleman Stephen? No, Stefan was not allowed to participate. Oh, he went over the other side of the okay. river with his um, harem and... Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but they were trying to decide, do, do we, you know, have we been duped? Are we no longer the church because of a false leader? Are we, um, um, should we go back to Germany now to our home congregations with our tail between our legs and apologize for, for leaving? So that was really became, became the question. So the, so the resolution was they come up with these points, and the one that I think is, um, um, that, that makes the most sense is, and, and it's, it's sort of cornerstone to how we view our sacraments, okay? That it isn't the person administering the sacraments that has to be holy, it's the word of God that makes it holy. Mm -hmm. and, and they determined that, right. they, they, they said, hey, just because that guy went nuts doesn't mean that what he was doing in baptisms and serving the Lord's Supper were wrong. So how do you define the church? And for LCMS, this is, this is something we still talk about today in our seminaries and now. We don't talk about it much in the congregations, but it's really how do you define the church? How would you define the church? Well, here's how the LCMS decided. That the word of God would be preached, okay? Both law and gospel would be preached and that the sacraments would be rightly administered. And rightly administered means in the word of God. So we add nothing and we take nothing away from the word of God and the administering of the sacraments. So when we, when, we, when we consecrate the elements at the beginning, you know, the beginning of the communion service, part of the service, we don't add anything to it. We don't, the pastor doesn't add any words. He doesn't go, you know, well, this is hip, you know. It's, um, um, they use exactly the words from Scripture, so they're rightly administered. And that became the cornerstone for us to determine what makes a church. Yes, ma'am? It makes me think when we're at the rail getting sacraments, according, I believe, to Martin Luther, it's Christ, I vision Christ giving me the host in yeah. the way, not pastor or right. one yeah. of the elders. In the same way with coming into the house of prayer, as much as I love you and pastor, I'm not coming to worship you. Right. And, and that's the other lesson that needs to be learned. And I think it's sort of goes back to the other conversation about the other organization. And those guys have become, you know, icons upon themselves. And, um, and they think they can make no mistake. Um, so, it isn't the pastor, it's the word of God that makes things sacred. And um, where you go, um, the, the, the two things should be observed to make sure that you're going to a church is the word preached solidly. You know, are you getting five ways to be happy or are you getting the gospel? And, you know, law and gospel, are you getting that presented to you? and are the sacraments properly administered. That's how we determine what a church is. And that was said back in, in, in all of the conflict and, and stuff that was going on um, along the Zion and the Mississippi, um, you know, almost 200 years ago, that um, they were establishing these ideals that help us today express our faith in the way that we do. So, but it all came up in conflict. So, Having said all that, um, um, let us, unless there are any questions, comments, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that we are in a body of believers, but there are problems and, and there can be conflicts. But Lord God, we, we thank you that your spirit has revealed to us means and methods to, um, to resolve conflict, to continue to walk in concord with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord God, we, um, 
we pray that that spirit of uh, cooperation uh, continues to exist in this body and in all the body of Christ um, and in our families, Lord God, that your spirit of, um, of putting the best spin on things so that we, uh, we avoid useless conflict, but at the same time are not afraid to call publicly call out sin, Lord God, that we do it in a loving and kind way with compassion and understanding. Give us your word as we go from here keeping us safe and ever in your care. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.